It's Wednesday, July 31st here at the West End Gun Club. I'm back at the Rimfire Range. Um, it's early morning, just after 5.30. It's going to be a warm day, a pretty hot day actually today, so I wanted to get out here really early to shoot um, while it's still cool. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. Had the day off, so I just wanted to do some shooting today. Um, forgot my microphone. I uh, left it out of my, my photo bag since the last range vlog when I shot the NRL 22 match. So hopefully this all syncs up, or hopefully I don't have very much difficulty syncing all the audio up from my microphone to the camera in post. But I don't know, it could be a long edit for this vlog, but hopefully not. Anyway, I'm going to get, go ahead and get unpacked, uh, get my gear set up on the line, and uh, we'll just do some casual shooting today. One of the things I want to do this morning is just velocity test this SK uh, rifle match because I have a new lot. Six bricks of this stuff, so I just wanted to get a quick read. Um, I forgot my my memory card for my lab or my Magneto speed because I took it out when I was copying the data off the card. But it looks like it'll work without the memory card. It'll just won't save anything. Hopefully, um, it'll work. But it's on, so we'll just see if it does actually read. Well, I just have it quickly. Uh, my magneto speed setup with the wiser setup on this on my uh, 22 but the thing is i had to move my my bipod all the way back just so i could fit the wiser precision mount without doing too much back and forth with the uh with the bracket i kind of want to leave it where it's at just so i can uh don't have to worry about reconfiguring it for my uh, center fire but this will be fine i don't care about groups i just want to get um velocity reads so we'll do that really quickly and hopefully the magneto speed returns the data. Although I should get a pen and a notepad because I don't have a memory card. Shot error, sensor two not detected, signal strength low, memory card not found. Okay, so I think this means I need to increase the power the sensitivity rather so I'm on custom set sensitivity custom so it's on four high sensitivity is 11 so let's go bump it up to eight and hope for the best I don't think I ejected that round, but yeah. Shot error, sensor two not detected, signal low. So let's try it one more time. Let's set the sensitivity. Custom, let's max it out. All right, sensitivity is 11. That doesn't work then. No idea what's going on there. Okay, that got it. Wow, 11.15, huh? Start writing these down before I lose them. 1086, 1072. 82. I think that was the last round. Yeah, it's got 15 on there. Okay. So 
15 around ag with this new lot of SK, uh, if it even matters to anybody watching this thing. Lot number is 07654 slash 21124. Uh, we're looking at an average of 1082. Standard deviation of 13.3 and exterior spread, I have no idea because it won't show it to you if you, if you select SD as the display. But um, you can quickly get ES. Uh, minimum is 63, max 1063, max is 1115. So whatever, subtract that, you got your spread. But all right, so I know velocity's on the SK. Let's bust out the old batch of SK that I was shooting um, the past few months. It's the old style gold box stuff that you no longer can get. Well, you probably can get if they've got a uh, new old stock. But I shot this at the Aaron All 22 match last or two weekends ago. Last weekend, the weekend before last. 55. Wow. That was really bad. 10.55. It's like a, this is going to result in about a 45 spread. And that 10.55 round did drop 6 o'clock position on my target. 10.90. That was 10 rounds. All right. So the old box, or the, sorry, the, yeah, the older new stock averages 10.79, SD of 13.9. Min max 1055, max 1102. Yeah, it's almost a 50 spread. Um, but 1079 average versus, what did I say for this stuff? 1082, so it's not even off that much, uh, three feet per second average. But the point of impact zero is lower for this stuff. Who knows? I don't know why that, why that is, but it's impacting lower. So if anything, I might have to adjust my zero when I switch to the new stock, this uh, new stuff by a tenth of a mil, which isn't. Too bad, but I mean, it makes a difference here in, in rimfire. So, anyway, done for this, done testing here. So, let's get uh, start shooting some steel. And I brought some props out here because I kind of wanted to uh, kind of do a recap of NRL 22. So, um, I know a lot of guys are asking about uh, some specific details that happened during the last match or just asking about what, what I did at the NRL 22 match. So, I figure I'll go ahead and just discuss some of those things because I didn't really do a recap at the end of that vlog. I was just sort of just saying, hey, done shooting for the day, um, time to go home, right? That sort of thing. So let's go ahead and start talking some details, especially bags and um, some stuff that I should have done during that match because I, I mentioned in the last vlog stuff that I should have done and, um, and reflecting on it, I, I think I have more insight onto uh, just some of the things that I was lacking and, um, and I guess my technique and my skill set for, for shooting that kind of, uh, that kind of format. So uh, let's get this bench out of the way. So all these practical rifle matches are obviously about uh, big on uh, barricades and props and just basically shooting out of non prone position. So um, I think, uh, so the big thing about NRL 22 or any um, NRL PRS match or whatever, uh, it's big on bags. And so a lot of guys are asking me about the bags that I use. And um, I've tried to, I mentioned it in previous vlogs constantly that I use, I'm really kind of hung up on the, uh, not hung up, but sort of, uh, a fan of the Armageddon gear slash Razor Precision because I think Razor Precision makes it for Armageddon gear the uh, Game Changer bag. So I bought the Game Changer last year or a year, two years ago? Two years ago maybe. I got their, their OG one, the original one. And so uh, I got that one and it's cool and all but then they came out with the pint sized and wax canvas and I got one of those and I've just been a huge fan of that one. It's a smaller version of that. So we'll, I'll bring the, I'll show you basically how that it functions, but I got this sawhorse from uh, Home Depot. It's just a nice fold-out sawhorse. That was really cool. It just fits into, it'll just fold up, fit in your car or your truck or whatever, uh, relatively easily. And so I'll use this for like a barricade type thing to demonstrate some things, but I didn't read the manual, so we'll figure out if I can, if I can do this. Okay. That's good. That's good. You can get the same thing off Amazon, same exact brand. Um, but if you're more inclined to just get it locally without having to wait for Amazon, by all means do it. Uh, if you're willing to go to Home Depot. But anyway, so set up a barricade here. Um, I use the Game Changer bag 
for the most part, this wax canvas pint size. So I have two more, as I said earlier. Well, I do have two more. The one I mentioned earlier was the original Game Changer. And then uh, I have another pint size Game Changer, which is the Area 419 version, which comes with this Arco rail uh, clamp system, like this pocket for it, which I'll bust out in a second. But I'm gonna go ahead and set up another camera so you get a closer look on this stuff. So I have the Game Changer original, uh, also ca called the optimized Game Changer, I think. I think. Then I have the Game Changer pint-sized uh, wax canvas. This was a multi-cam, this was a wax canvas. And I have another Game Changer pint-sized Area 419 edition with the Area 419 logo on there. Uh, and it has this, this slot here for an Arca rail, which is actually on this steel. I can't remember what this is called, uh, but this is also an Area 419 product. Uh, in collaboration with, uh, I think, Army Getting Gear. But this is basically kind of just a small, kind of uh, for the four-end type bag for fits and barricades. But as you see here, it has this uh, Arca Swiss rail that you can also put on the game changer. So you can have the game changer fixed to your your stock uh, or your four-end. Um, and I'll go ahead and just quickly demonstrate that because I did run this uh, at the match last, uh, or two weekends ago. But basically the premise is I guess you can go either way, put it fore or aft. Um, I think I ran it like this. I'm not entirely sure. I think I ran it like this. I don't know. Is there a right or wrong way to do things on this? But So basically, it just hooks up like that. Um, where is my, my ECI? Drop the mag here. So basically, it just sits there and so you can have it on the on the gun without having to worry about uh you know having to put it or you just rest in the bag so you just easily shoot off the barricade and move to the next one so i use this i use this during the uh uh i guess you want to call those things this uh viking tactical style barricades i don't think it necessarily was a viking tactical one but it was that's what porthole so you can just i would shove through the porthole shoot move shoot and porthole so this one's better for that because it's thinner, it's not as high profile as this one because this one sometimes is too tall and you can't fit the whole gun in the porthole. So it's better to have something flatter like this so you can rest it. Um, there's an argument that don't, you don't even need a bag on that barricade type porthole uh, setup. You just rest the gun on the, on the ledge right there and use the one bag for your arm, assuming you're restricted to one bag. So um, the NRL, NRL 22 uh, format, those stages limited you to one bag. They say the size of a small volleyball or a volleyball. I don't think there's a different size volleyball, but size of a volleyball. So that's why these game chambers were, are popular because they fit that requirement and they're good. So as far as the OG versus the uh, pint size, the reason why I like the, the pint size is I think they're about the, they feel like they're the same weight, surprisingly enough especially the wax canvas. If you're gonna get a game changer, forget the Cordura or whatever this is. This, I think this is Cordura. Forget this, get the wax canvas. There's something about the wax canvas that makes it stiffer, um, the shell. And uh, the pint size, it just feels more dense. This just feels like a big, bigger bag and it just feels not as, not as dense. So this feels like it gives you more support. Um, and also this one, I use this frequently as a rear bag because you can just flip it I guess upside down, if you want to call this upside down, and use it like a bunny ear bag, and that's what I do. Um, it fits the MPA stock because uh, they uh, demonstrated the this new this new uh, bag rider for to fit this style, such that you can rest the uh, rifle rear on this bag, and then kind of use this this hook here to kind of pinch the whole thing together. So that's what I try to do, and it actually works pretty well for me. Um, but I'm a huge fan of this Game Changer. I know a lot of guys, when the first Game Changer came out, they're like, well, yeah, it's great, but it's no different than other bags out there in terms like the, um, I think Weebad has their fortune cookie. And they call it the fortune cookie, I think that's the one. Um, but they're all the same premise, it's just, you know, how you use it, right? So. I don't know. I'm just a huge fan of this one. I highly recommend if you're going to get one game changer bag, get the pint size game changer and wax canvas. I think you will like it very much. Uh, um, but I've been using this for quite some time now or frequently for the past several months. So that's what I'm rolling with. 
I published an article recently um, on the Kessel 5700 Elite. I, I'd mentioned that I may or may not write an article on about it, or article on it. I went ahead and did it. Um, I mean, like I, I was trying to mention in, in previous range vlogs, I mean, this has been out for a long time and people more authoritative than me have written reviews on it. So uh, the value of me doing it is debatable, but it's just sort of my perspective and I just wanted to give my view on it. And ultimately, if you don't want to read that article, basically it's expensive, 700 bucks, but I think it has value. So I like it. I don't think um, I would get rid of it. I mean, this is, I use it like constantly, especially for stuff like this. So um, to get, to get my dope in real conditions with the real time conditions for the distances I want. So anyway, I got seven steel targets, three banks or four banks. I would have had eight, but I brought the wrong hanger out there. So if I recall, I have it at 64 yards. Oh, sorry. I have one at 52, 52, 64, uh, 84, 82, and then 94. So I skipped 75 for some reason, but what's it matter? Um, but I just set those out there to shoot at. So, and I have uh, another target out there just laying on the ground. If I decide to walk out there and set up another, uh, another bank, I can do it or another target hanger. But yeah, I can adjust my range card on here because I can just preset my range card for the target distances that I have up to, I think, uh, how many can I do on this thing? Whatever A through J is. Um, but anyway, uh, that's the range card. You can still have your regular dope chart here going out to like a however infinite yardage that you want. But anyway, today I need 0.4, sorry, point, well, zero, my 52 yard, or 52 is just right on my 50 zero. I need 0 0.4, 1.1, 1 .1, and 1.6 or 1.7. So let's try 0 0.411.17, given the current conditions. So, and I used this during the NRL 22 match, um, and it's pretty much accurate. But anyway, just sort of demonstration what was going on again, how I was using the bag. Um, just fold up this bipod. Uh, I left the bipod most of the time, most of the time, and you can just sort of use that, kind of like that. Um, if you have your bipod there, you can kind of use this, the uh, the bipod to kind of suck it into the bag if you want. Um, there's arguments both ways how you want to how you want to um, load on the on the uh, rifle. Sometimes you want to some say you want to just load into the rifle. Some say actually with higher recoil with actual center fire you might want to just pull back on it kind of pull the rifle towards you. Um, there's two schools of thought. Do what, do you, right? Pick whatever you like, whatever works for you. So one of the mistakes that I was making during that match I want to bring up right now is the fact that I always wanted to go with a high magnification. And I was always on too high and I was trying to track where my target was once I got onto the barricade. Because when you, when you start in position, right? This high you start port arms, bolts back, magazines in, right? And you drop into position. Then you're not allowed to close the bolt. Sorry, that was trying to ride home on its own, but you're not supposed to close the bolt until you get on target, right? And so what was happening is I had my magnification set kind of high, let's say 15X, right? And I'm sitting there trying to find a target, right? Because my field of view is crap at 15X. So trying to find a target at uh, anywhere from whatever, 50 yards to 100 yards to 150. So it's kind of a dial down, trying to locate my target, and then I would zoom it, you know, increase the mag again. So the question is, do I just learn how to, stay, let's say I go with 8X, do I just go ahead and shoot 8X? Or do I bother getting on target, starting at 8X, getting on target, and then using and increasing the magnification? I don't know. So I just need to see what works for me. Um, I don't shoot this style of match that much. So it's just something I have to learn how to do. Um, as far as learning how to just deal with uh, Try not to get sucked into using the higher magnification of my scope. And I think the problem too um, is when I when I try to get the magnification increased again once I'm on target, right? So I'll plop down, 
find target, increase mag, let's say whatever, right? I just randomly push into what feels comfortable and I'll end up on like, let's say 15X, right? Now get on, I'll take my shot and then I'll transition, right? And so what, I, I'm at 15X, right? And I'm trying to track for a new target. Let's say it's 30 yards this way or to laterally. Then I'm sitting here trying to find it and so I have to dial my magnification down. So I just question whether or not I just need to start learning how to shoot low mag um, when you have such a, especially with NRL 22, you gotta shoot a lower mag because the targets are closer than they would be in center fire. At least center fire 10X, you can probably get away with at like 500 yards, the field of view is gonna be decent. But it, with a close range, anywhere between 50 to 100 yards and maybe up to 200, depending on what kind of club match you're shooting, 10x might still be too too high of a magnification to be able to get a good field of view. So I might start having to practice shooting like 7x or 8x. Um, for all you season 22 shooters, NRL 22 shooters, or even just regular NRL or PRS shooters, I don't know what your opinion is on this, but um, yeah. But that's the kind of thing I noticed in that last match. So again, lessons learned, right? Um, I probably should have dialed. Sorry, I've been talking and not remembering what my dopes are. But I still hit that target because it's so big. So what did I say? 1.8? 1.7. Whatever. 1.7. 1.7 for that 95 yard target. Eh, close enough. So yeah, um, that's another observation from the last match, that match I shot. Oh, one other thing is the fact that uh, I do have a barricade stop, right? That comes with these MPA chassis. This one came with my, uh, this came with my BA comp chassis, right? And this is all ubiquitous for all MPA chassis that have their, uh, their system on there. So I could have put that on there and had a barricade stop. Um, I think this might have helped me on the barricade because I could use the barricade stop, um, especially on the tank trap thing. Because the tank trap deal, I was trying to use the bipod as my barricade stop. And I'm not entirely sure how to best approach that. Some guy basically said, hey man, that's the best way to go about it. So I did it that way. If you saw the, I don't think I recorded myself because I forgot to set up the camera, but I recorded other people doing it. And so they were basically using the bipod legs, kind of, uh, let me just show it to you real quick. And for safety reasons, even though I'm the only one here, I'll go ahead and drop the mag, put an ECI in. And then, um, so basically what they were doing was, if just picture this as a leg, they were using the bipod over that straddling it and then kind of uh, using that as support and then shooting on top of the barricade or on top of the tank trap like that. Um, it was cool in the sense that it did work and you could use your bag because you're restricted to one bag. I think we were restricted to one bag. Were we restricted to one bag? I don't recall. But the stipulation was that you could not have any part of the rifle support touching the ground, which is why you had to, uh, you couldn't use the bag on the ground. You had to be on the tank trap. So anyway, um, I thought maybe it would have been better to have a barricade stop uh, and then just use something like maybe Kind of just rest the gun directly forehand right directly on the tank trap and just use the barricade stop to wedge in there and use my rear bag of support for the rear um i don't know i did grab my uh shooting mat because i'm killing my knees on this concrete um but one of the official courses of fire during last the match that i shot uh the official course of fire included a bucket stage two gallon bucket five gallon bucket shoot off of both right so there were two approaches to this. You either put the bag on the, you put the bag on the front for your bucket, or use the bag for the back on the rear because you're restricted to one bag. And I used it on the front, but I watched some guy shoot it on the with the bag on the rear and just rested his rifle directly on the bucket. And I think that might have honestly been the better approach. Now that I think about it, but it all depends on your body type, right? Because some guys can shoot this prone, and so you might be able to use the rear back for support. But I believe, I can't remember now. I'm almost positive I shot it uh, from this kind of weird crouch position where I'm on my knees and I use my elbows on the ground for support because I could do it. My body type allowed for that. And so 
I think I opted for this route and it worked for me, right? Again, shoot what works for you. Shit. That's one other thing is remember to take your UCI out. But where's my target? So again, I'm on 8X, zeroed out, parallax. But I'm pretty sure I shot it like this because my body type allowed for it. But when it came to the five gallon bucket, I'm almost positive I shot it sitting. I might've shot it sitting. And then uh, you might've needed the, the bag on the front depending on how your body type is to get more elevation. And from a sitting position, the bag wouldn't have helped you much because you could use your elbows, put your, your, the, the backs of your arms onto your, uh, your thighs for support. But this is kind of, I'm pretty sure I shot the two gallon bucket like this. So again, little techniques here and there, find out where it works for your body type. There you go. I'm off to the left. So I'm gonna give me two right. Try one more time. There you go. So I said 1.1 for the 80 target. Switch to my sunglasses because the sun's starting to come out. Um, so one other item I wanted to bring up that I think hurt me a lot, I think out of all the, all the little nuances during that match is my bipod setup. And I want to say bipod setup in terms of the, of the uh, height, right? You have your bipod set up for a certain height on your legs, right? By definition, you're not supposed to be able to, to get on target before the rounds or the stage starts. So you should be able to have your gun set up to, ready to go, right? And you plop down and shoot. So the problem with this, this, this whole mantra is the fact that your bipod, my, what, a couple of times my bipod wasn't at the correct height I needed to be, right? Um, too low, too high, right? And so I, w I wasted time trying to adjust to like right now, I'll be on, I'm low on target, right? Um, and I'll try to sit here with the bag, trying to flatten the bag, and maybe I'll shoot without the bag and, it's, and that sort of thing. So the problem here is then I would, I'm on the clock, I'd adjust my legs, you know, I'm wasting how many seconds, you know, I, the seconds spent finding out that my, my bipod height wasn't good enough, and then the seconds spent extending my legs, and the seconds spent getting back on target, which I'm good now. So that's all fine. Um, that's time wasted. Um, so I think the thing is, I probably need to get a better idea of remembering what my bipod leg should be in terms of height given like level conditions and not level conditions. And I think it's better to be taller than it is shorter on your legs. It's, it's better to start off taller than you need to be because at least with taller, if it's too tall, you can still use your bag in various ways to stack the height a little bit better. So if it's too tall, I can, can put my bag kind of lengthwise and rest it like that. I can try to uh, squeeze it more on one end, flip it like this to squeeze it more there. And therefore I can get the elevation I need on the back end. So it's better than being too short because if you're too short, then you're sitting here trying to, trying to get the, the muzzle up, get on target. So that, I think that was probably the most um, critical thing that I dropped points on uh, that match. Aside from not remembering when to transition on a target. So that's just me not knowing my course of fire in my head. So let's do So right now, I'm, I'm set up for level, right? 
and I'm too short to get to the top banks with my bag. So, I mean, for these conditions, like on this area, I probably need to go as tall as possible, right? And then if I were to shoot the same prone or the same level target to 50, what I could do is just try to figure out how to uh, stack my bag in such a manner that I still get support on the rear end. And I think I'm level now. And I'm good to go. And now I can go to the tall tar or the, the upper bank targets. So 65 is roughly 0.4. Then I'm gonna do is flatten my bag out to get the bore on target. Where's my round hitting? Okay, there it is. And I said 1.7 for the 95. Yep. Second round just for fun. So yeah, I think that's kind of what I need to learn how to make sure that I stall. If anything, I set my bipod legs taller than shorter. But one of the uh, things that I, observations that I also made is the fact that uh, some of that time goes quick, right? When you're on the clock, uh, 120 seconds sounds long, but at the same time, uh, on these longer stages where you're, we're shooting barricades and you're really trying to get on target, right? And you're trying to work your rifle, uh, time flies. And I timed out on two stages, I think. I think I timed out on two stages. Uh, in service rifle, we had time stages, right? We would shoot 60, we would shoot uh, 10 rounds rapid fire sitting in a, in a time limit of 60 seconds. You start in position, drop in, drop in, start standing, start dropping a sitting and shoot 200 yards, uh, 10 rounds. Then the rapid prones, you'd start in standing, drop in a prone, 10 rounds, 60 seconds. That was pretty easy, right? I mean, well aimed shots, right? Because you're shooting on a paper target, you know, the 10 ring is what? a 10 ring on a on an SR target guys it's been so long 13 inch black for the nine I think it might have been a six inch black for the 10 ring six and a half inch six inch at 200 yards and the same for 300 I think it's a six inch. it's the same it's just one the black goes out to the eight ring on 300 so anyway you're shooting trying to shoot well aimed shots in a 10 rounds 60 seconds um, and you're in a static position, right? Once you build a position, you're shooting sitting and you, you no move, very little movement there, so it's easier. But when you're shooting 10 rounds in 120 seconds on an NRL 22 or any kind of uh, you know, practical rifle match, the uh, time can fly because un if, unless you're shooting flawless in your technique and you're struggling, you can time out. And so I timed out. Like that one stage where I, I had my bipod height, I had to adjust it twice, I think. And I timed out on that one. And I can't remember which other one I timed out on, but it's something to be aware of. And I thought about back in the day when I shot service rifles, some guy, I actually had a, my own timer, right? So you would keep your, once they called, hey, um, you know, ready on the right, ready on the left, all ready on the firing line, sh you know, you maybe commence fire when your target appears. Once the target came up, I would hit my, my stopwatch or my timer because that's when officially the clock starts, right? When the targets come up. So I hit my timer, so I had that right on the side so I can keep an eye on my uh, how much time we had left um, in that string of fire. So when I do my mag change, I kind of just eyeball it really quickly. But after a while, I didn't need that because once you have a proper cadence in that format, you don't really need a timer, right? If anything, you might need a timer to slow down your shooting because I know some guys shoot really fast. Um, I have this video too of Dennis DeMille. Um, Dennis DeMille is the uh, still the manager of Creedmoor Sports. National champion. Um, I think service rifle and match rifle. Um, you know, Marine, uh, retired Marine. Um, he, uh, I have a, a, vi a video of him shooting two strings of fire at Camp Pendleton uh, way back, I think 2008 maybe. Uh, but he's holds, he still holds the record for 200 yards sitting. I think it's like 200 with God knows how many X's. Because for those who don't know, 
when you shoot the um, rapid fire stages in NRA matches, you have a, uh, it's a string of fire is 10 rounds, max score is 100. So the 10 ring is 10, X ring is 10. But to what's called a perfect score, a clean is just shooting all 10s, right? Or better, but a perfect score would be shooting all Xs. So if you shoot 200 with 20 Xs, that's what Dennis did in a, um, I think he did it in a regional or something. You keep going, you shoot another string of fire, like everyone else is off the line, right? You shoot another string of fire for record, right? So you shoot again. And so if you shoot another, if you shoot 100 with 10 Xs, then you keep going. And that's like, I think, so he, I think he shot 200 with 38 or 28. I can't remember, but he holds the record and no one else has done that yet. Um, I'm pretty sure somebody will. Um, that, he did that with a match rifle. I think somebody's going to have to do it now with a service rifle because we have scopes. So that could change the game. I never thought about that. Yeah, with scopes, you could probably shoot a 220X as long as your position was good. And let me check the round. But anyway, my point is, um, I have a video of Dennis and Mill shooting 200 yard sitting. And he also has a timer on his gun. He would keep a timer or a little, the clock or his little, yeah, timer device on a pick rail mount right there. So you just get in a position, hit the button, and when you're on the gun, you can literally see the time in your face. I honestly don't think Dennis needs that. He probably just does it for his own edification to see his pace. But in that regard, I thought about getting one to put on like something like this if I was going to shoot another NRL style match, right? Because maybe it would be prudent to do that so you have the time in your face. Like, hey, you know what? Maybe I need to pick up the pace or something or I know where I'm at, right? <laughs> Granted, that also adds self-pressure, right? You're putting pressure on yourself because now you have the clock in your face rather than focusing on the task at hand. So it's, a, uh, it's up to debate. <laughs> but those kind of timers on pick rail mats, they exist. I mean, we've been using them in service rifle or, mat or NRA high power for a while, so. One administrative detail is the fact that I bought more magazines. So I have, now have four mags. I used to have two 10 rounders, now four 10 rounders, plus two fives and a uh, sled, single loader. But it's nice to have those mags ready to go for a match. So just trying to swap flies, sorry. Um, have mags ready to go so I don't have to worry about loading constantly, right? But it's also nice to have an extra mag in the event that you have a malfunction, that you have to drop the mag and you have to load a new one. Because if you're only stuck with one mag, then you got to drop it, load it by hand, and it's just, you don't have time for that, right, during the stage. But it's fortunate that the CZ mags are readily available. Um, and they're kind of expensive, like 25 bucks for a 10-rounder, I think. Um, but at least they're available. I know the new, C, the new uh, Tika, the T1X or T3X, whichever one is the uh, rimfire. I heard those magazines are hard to come by right now. And those are becoming quite popular because Tika makes a good rifle. Um, but one last item of note I want to bring up regarding that match and kind of the revelations I got from it was the fact that I realized I was spending time adjusting the elevation knob. And you know, that's a given, right? But at the same time, I have a, you know, I have an EBR reticle, right? The, the, uh, um, the Vortex EBR reticle, which is, you know, it's a mill reticle with hash marks. So why am I not using the hash marks? So I thought to myself, I need to practice using the hash marks on the reticle rather than making the adjustments every time I transition to a target. So instead of dialing the scope, I'll just dial the parallax or dial the elevation, I'll dial par parallax. Then for this 64 yard target, I'll hold about half mil and make a hit, right? So I transition to, what did I say, 82? You know, I'll just adjust my parallax accordingly and then hold up 1.1. So it makes sense, right? Now I'm gonna transition to my 95 yard target roughly, just parallax, hold up 1.7, 1.8. 
So yeah, I mean, I can make those hits. So I think I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I just do that? Granted, I've shot strings of fire where I did hold over and I didn't shoot accurately, like I mean, I missed. But it means I just need to practice doing this more, right? Learning how to just work with the ele you know the mill reticle for elevation come ups rather than trying to. If I need to make a quick shot and I know my dope already, why don't I just hold up? So, yeah, I'm going to start practicing that more because it's just so, when you're not on the clock, just shooting casually at the range, it's so easy to get caught up. Hey, you know what? Just dial the adjustment, right? So why don't I just start not doing that? Just use the parallax and roll with it. And of course, I just missed that shot. Since I'm out here and I have the sling in my backpack, um, I don't know if this is gonna show up on camera very well, but I figure I'll go over. Um, one thing a lot of guys, I read on forums and stuff, especially when it comes to service rifle shooters, how to use a sling properly, and they're complaining about, they're complaining about the uh, pulse, like the bounce, they're feeling it in the, in the, uh, in the sling. Um, this is a, this will work sufficient for demonstration, but, um, the last match I used my service rifle sling, so if I were, this is a good time to use it for a demonstration. And if I can find out what I just did with my, uh... oh, here it is. So I have this Arca, this Arca Swiss clamp that really rice stuff made. I actually bought it to, to uh, as a POC to use a uh, Magpul sling as a camera, uh, as a camera strap. Anyway, it has a QD mount on the bottom of this Arca rail, or this Arca mount. And so I put a QD mount on the service rifle sling, even though you never run it like that, but I did it for the sake of this match. But um, so for anyone who's wondering how to use a sling, this is what, how you get the sling on your arm without pulse or minimize pulse. So I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna do a video sometime maybe for new, newer shooters on how to use the, uh, let me take the bipod off, it's getting in the way how to properly set up a service rifle sling. But anyway, barring that fact, just ignore the fact if you don't know how to set up a sling like this. But for those shooters that do, when you, when you mount the gun, the frogs, I mean, I'm using terminology in terms of a uh, service rifle, but these metal deals on a, on, a, on a national match style sling, call them frogs. They're supposed to be towards the, they're all like facing the gun this side. Anyway, you're gonna outboard the sling this way, assuming you have your sling properly set up. Um, if you look online, they call it the Marine Corps way, right? Which is, I don't know why they call it Marine Corps way. It's just the way you're supposed to do it. Doesn't mean it's a Marine Corps uh, method, but it's the correct way to do it. The old school army way to do it, like they, in those old videos from like 1920s, that's the wrong way to do it. The whole sling setup is incorrect. Anyway, assuming you have a setup this way, when you tighten up the sling, Obviously the sling loop, you have this, you have this like the keepers here. Where you place the sling on your arm, um, ideally you're wearing like a sweatshirt and a shooting coat, but you need to get above the bicep right here, right? And the brachial artery is running on the inside of your arm right around here or so. But what you wanna do to minimize that is to get this sling such that you tighten it up such that this direction that comes away from the loop, that goes, it's like around this section right here. I, I wanna say it like along, kind of along the, uh, away from the brachial sort of. Um, ideally it would be more inboard towards the brachial, but I found that this position right around here, above the bicep, this coming away from the, away from the sling, or sorry, away from the loop towards the rifle along this axis right here. If you look at my bicep or my arm, come in this direction. So I guess maybe two o'clock position. Tighten that sucker up, right? Once you get that cinched up and in a behind on the arm, you're not gonna have pulse. So once you finally get in there and get your arm in there and you, and you get in the position, when you get into position, that sling 
should work its way up away from the brachial and you should have a nice no pulse situation. So that even if you're in a high stress situation, like on the clock, you shouldn't feel pulse, right? That's just my, I've always functioned like this. I've never had a pulse issue ever with a sling um, in service rifle when I've run it like this. So I don't know, this might look crappy on this video because I just ad hoc did it because I found my, my service rifle sling in my backpack. But for all those service rifle shooters, I always come across, they're like, oh yeah, I got too much pulse. Well, this is how you get away, you know, I get around it. But make sure your sling is set up properly, high in the arm, above the bicep, brachial artery. That's pretty much what's called the pulse. So position your sling such that you're not getting that brachial artery, um, causing that pulse to translate into the sling and you won't have issues. And do this without, the, without your sweatshirt and without your shooting coat on. So it's just an I get a better idea of how your sling should be set up. And after that, once you figure out the position, you can put on the sling and uh, the sweatshirt and a coat and then do it again. And then you'll find that you're pretty much rock solid as far as your sling. So then that's just me. Um, hopefully that helps for those wondering, but um, I mean, I shot service rifle for a long time like that and it worked for me. Granted, I think my sitting position still needed to evolve in my final years of shooting that, but prone just sling was so easy. Um, my prone position was pretty much rock solid. Hopefully the discussions of the lessons learned from the NRL 22 match was interesting or even beneficial to you. I, I talked about lots of things that I realized that were mistakes and the things that I can do to mitigate them and sort of my gaps in my skill set as far as that style of shooting is. Um, hopefully that discussion, you know, you can take those ideas and say, hey, you know what, I can adapt some of the things he discussed or hey, I have those same issues, maybe I should try to try to mitigate those in the ways that you know were discussed in the vlog so i don't know i just sort of the range vlog like a lot of times i just shoot and that's it and hey you know this is what i'm doing but i like to i also like to have discussions you know and that's what what shooting's about as far as just trying to grow in the discipline uh whether it's recreational or competitive but uh and I know a lot of guys were asking about the bags. They, I always get asked about the bags, right? And so far, if you've been watching any of my vlogs in the past year and a half now, probably has a game changer in it somewhere. Um, whether it's this one or the OG, um, which is on the ground over there. But um, but yeah, uh, I might write an article on the game. I, I am going to write an article on the game changers. I I was going to do one last year, but I just things changed and I just sort of lagged on it and then I got the then I got the pint size which I'm really more of a fan of than the original one so I know I'm gonna do an article sometime I mean obviously uh, what can you do an article on bags right it's gonna be short and sweet right maybe short and sweet it's gonna have a lot of pictures because you know you know me I like to take photos of stuff so um, but you know I'm just gonna explain like how I use it and why I think it's it's a really good bag I mean I'm sure there's others out there but this I really like this bag I mean this style it works great and I love the pint size because it's just so dense and the weight of it, the heft of it, it's just perfect. It's it's still portable, but it, it provides such great support. It's so versatile. So anyway, I know it's hopefully this discussion answered those questions and all those inquiries I've been receiving about what bag I use. I always get that on even past videos. So aside from that, um, just gonna, I'm gonna pack up the rest of the gear and get out of here. I count all my steel. Um, I can't stress enough how I love the NRL 22 steel package. I, it's expensive, comparatively speaking. Granted, there's nothing else out there that I've seen. I'm sure some of you guys have local uh, AR500 steel retailers or vendors who can make targets for you. But the fact that I can order that steel package from JC Steel Targets, and I have uh, 10 steel targets plus the, uh, the uh, KYL rack, I mean, it's, it allows me to shoot 22 you know 100 200 300 yards and have such a versatile like array of of you know targets to practice on you can't duplicate it that cost if you're going to shoot center fire if you're going to get that many steel targets for center fire because you, you got to scale up right um if you're going to shoot you know to a thousand yards the amount of steel you'll need is it's a lot more than the 300 something dollars i paid for this so i i suggest you if you're shooting rimfire and you want to get more more fun out of it definitely get a get a steel an array of steel from somebody get some air and it's not even that thick i think that might be quarter inch maybe three eighths i don't know i didn't measure but you don't need much you don't you just need ar 500 or you want ar 500 so it'll last forever it's gonna last a lifetime if you're gonna shoot it with rimfire but just get a bunch of steel for rimfire and i think you'll you'll have more fun and you'll get more especially when you're just new shooters because shooting on paper it gets boring for them um they'll people like to hear the hear the, the the ping of the steel or the uh 
the feedback, you know, the instant reaction, hey, you know what, I hit the target, great, you know, as, as opposed to, hey, can you spot that, can you see it in the paper? No, I can't really see it, or is that, did I just, you know, shoot a one hole group, or like, did I shoot two tar shots on one t on top of each other? You never know, right? So it's just like, they're bored, right? And so paper can get just sort of uninteresting after a while. So I think steel is great also for new shooters, but in general, for just practicing, especially from position, it's just nice to shoot steel, because shooting on paper, you know, sitting up cardboard, targets out there at various ranges and shooting on small dots you know you can accomplish the same thing but it just feels different and I just feel like that instant feedback is just great anyway that's it for today's range vlog um, not much else going on as far as shooting I am really 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 close to pulling the trigger on a Voodoo 22 um, I really shouldn't spend the money on it but I really want one um, I might actually get the MPA chassis first uh, because they all have a deal, they have a deal going on. Um, you get like, you get that, that enhanced, uh, bag rider that I just discussed earlier in the vlog. Um, I think you get a, another barricade stop. You got like three accessories for free on a rebate or whatever, as long as you buy it from an authorized dealer. And if you find authorized dealers like Euro Optic, um, there's a couple other places. There's a lot of authorized dealers, but their price is actually lower than the price on MPA Direct. So if you buy from them, they're an authorized dealer, then you just fill out the form, send a copy receipt to MPA, then you get those accessories. I think it's like a value of maybe 150, 200 bucks value of those products um, based on their, their retail prices. But then again, you, if you save like 50 or so dollars buying the chassis from someone else and you get that, that, that deal on the, uh, the free accessories, it's a good, good option. I think it ends in September? I want to say it ends in September. It might end in August, but so I might get the MPA chassis first and get that Voodoo 22, but I kind of want that Voodoo 22 now. But that means I need a, the Voodoo 22 barreled action for $1,700 or $1,800. The chassis, which is going to cost about $950, give or take, depending on options. I have a trigger. I have a Geisley trigger. For those that don't know, I've had a Geisley, um, that 700 trigger they came out with. I actually got an original one, had to send it back because they recalled them for certain steel issues. And I have another one. But it's been sitting in the wrapper all this time, and I never put it on anything. So I have a trigger, and I can put that on the Voodoo, and I can use that as a test bed. Um, then I'll need a scope, scope mount and base, and then that's where you'll spend money. So what, let's say $1,800, $950, let's round that off to like uh, $2,800, then another $2,500 for the scope. So you're talking upwards of $5,500 when it's all said and done with scope mount, or scope mount. A lot of money so i really shouldn't spend on it um i kind of want one though so i'm close i'm really close but we'll see anyway that's it for this range vlog um i'm gonna go home dish my gear take a shower and then go find some stuff to do today um run some errands and maybe meet some folks for lunch so anyway thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next vlog Just a quick addendum to the vlog. I pulled over onto the main line when I was leaving the range because I saw two familiar faces for, uh, that I haven't seen in quite some time. Uh, just a couple of buddies of mine that I shot service rifle with for a long time. Haven't seen them in maybe two or three years now. Um, so it was nice to catch up with them and we were talking for a good hour or so, a better part of an hour plus. Um, but yeah, it's great to see those familiar faces. But anyway, I need really need to get out of here now so I can actually do some stuff. It's getting uh, closer to 11 o'clock. So anyway, that's that. See you in the next vlog.